Hi, I'm Tammy Potter, and welcome to the Pregnancy Process Podcast, a show designed to help you navigate the hugely transformative journey to motherhood, where you'll hear the unique experience of experts in this area and the incredible stories of women sharing their conception, pregnancy, and postnatal journeys so that you can have a healthier, more informed pregnancy. In today's episode, I talk to maternal fetal medicine subspecialist obstetrician, Dr. Innie. With her extensive training and experience in obstetrics, Dr. Innie is here to help us navigate the often misunderstood world of gestational diabetes. And we understand gestational diabetes can feel overwhelming with a maze of conflicting information and persistent myths surrounding it. In this enlightening episode, Dr. Innie demystifies gestational diabetes, clarifying its causes, risk factors, and the importance of understanding this condition for expectant parents. We dive into the common misconceptions that often lead to feelings of guilt and anxiety. Dr. Innie also discusses the controversial aspects of diagnosing this condition, the various testing methods and alternatives for those hesitant about traditional glucose tolerance tests. Packed with expert insights and practical advice, this episode is essential for anyone navigating pregnancy. Whether you're currently pregnant, planning to conceive, or supporting someone who is, Dr. Innie's guidance will empower you to make informed choices for your health and your baby's well-being. Dr. Innie, thank you so much for your time today. It's fantastic to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited about this conversation. Like I said, I've been wanting to talk to someone about gestational diabetes for a long time now, since the inception of the podcast, because it is something that's quite prevalent. Mm -hmm. and, And I think there's still a lot of myths and misconceptions around it. So I really wanted to clear up some questions that I know are still floating around gestational diabetes. So let's dive straight in with what is gestational diabetes and how does it differ from other types of diabetes? Okay, so gestational diabetes is a specific type of diabetes that is only that occurs only in pregnancy. So you have to be a pregnant person to have gestational diabetes. So the reason why we think gestational diabetes occurs is that the placenta is like a sugar-making factory and different people's bodies uh, deal with that extra sugar in different ways. And that's the most... That, that's what gestational diabetes is. This is very different to pre-existing diabetes, type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes often occurs at a very young age and it's something that uh, people know about and come into pregnancy. And type 2 diabetes, which again is, is pre-existing diabetes prior to pregnancy. Now, sometimes type 2 diabetes is diagnosed for the first time in pregnancy, But this is still not gestational diabetes. So gestational diabetes is diabetes that is diagnosed in pregnancy and then goes away once the placenta is delivered or the pregnancy has finished. And just to get an understanding, because it's got a lot to do with your insulin levels and carbohydrates and all types of things. Can we go into a little bit more depth around the potential causes of it? So absolutely the baby uses glycogen for yes. is basically cre- your baby is basically created by carbs right absolutely um, and it's very necessary and obviously there's that complex breakdown of carbohydrates and insulin and hormones around gestational diabetes yes Can we go into a little bit more detail around that uh- Absolutely. It's a quite a complex sort of process, but absolutely. So as I said, the placenta is basically baby needs glucose for brain development and development of, of themselves. And glucose is the easiest way in which babies can use energy as well. And that's why even for women with pre-existing diabetes, we would still recommend that they have a certain amount of carbohydrates because it's important for the baby. And gestational diabetes is basically an imbalance or a resistance to the level of insulin that is created by the body which means that in pregnancy some women tip over the 
pre-existing criteria for when gestational diabetes is diagnosed to say that their the way their metabolism isn't responding to that extra load of glucose in the appropriate way. And so when it comes to a gestational diabetes diagnosis, I, I've personally worked with a few women, not many. I've worked yes. with a couple that yes. have been diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And yes. I know based on my experience working with these women that they feel so guilty about it, that something that they've done has caused the diagnosis or that they haven't been eating correctly and all that type of thing. So can we talk about the gestational diabetes diagnosis and what's actually caused the diagnosis? Absolutely. And so maybe some of the common risk factors for developing gestational diabetes. Absolutely. So in terms of, so I think the first thing is gestational diabetes is not brought on by anything that someone has done or not done okay the reason why in Australia we recommend universal screening is because we know that if we only based screening on women who have risk factors then we would probably miss about 15 percent of women with diabetes I think it's really important to know I think a lot of women can have guilt but it's absolutely nothing they've done or not done that's caused that to happen okay it happens to all walks of life now, the diagnosis of gestational diabetes itself remains controversial and different societies in different countries will have different cutoff levels as well. Most of the diagnosis is based on a large study in, which was published in 2008 called the HAPO study or the Hyperglycemia and Adverse Pregnancy Outcome Study, which looked at about more than 20,000 women and looked at the fasting levels and two-hour glucose levels after being challenged by 75 sort of grams of glucose. And by looking at that, they came up with a line to say, when were both babies and mothers at increased risk? of having abnormal glucose. And based on that, they came up with a level which looking at when babies were above the 90th percentile, which is when they were thought to be at increased risk and other sort of outcomes, they've come up with a diagnosis that if women fit one or more of the following glucose criteria, that they would be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. So that is a fasting glucose equal to or greater than 5.1 millimoles per litre, a one hour glucose greater than or equal to 10 millimoles per litre and a two hour glucose that is greater than or equal to 8.5 millimoles per litre. Now that's the Australian guidelines and support, supported by the International Society of, of Diabetes as well. However, uh, the Americans, for example, have different criteria, which are slightly less stringent than those that we have here in Australia. And there's always debates, and I know in the diabetes meetings that there's always debates as to where that level should be, okay? But there is a line in the sand. Now, there are many things that increase your risk of gestational diabetes. So things like if you've had gestational diabetes in a previous pregnancy, if there's been impaired glucose tolerance previously, if there's a first degree relative with diabetes, so that is a mother, a father, or a sibling, we also know that women who have a body mass index greater than or equal to 30 kilograms per meter squared are at slightly increased risk. Women above the age of 37, so we know that as women get older in their pregnancies, they have a slightly higher risk as well. And we also know that if you've had a birth of an infant above 4.2 kilograms, that also increases the risk of um, gestational diabetes in another pregnancy. And then there is also ethnicities where, because of genetic reason, women may be at increased risk. So in our population, particularly South Asian or Southeast Asian women, Pacific Islander women at increased risk of gestational diabetes compared to other populations. That's interesting. It's interesting about the age. Would that potentially be because as we age, mm -hmm. our BMI changes? That is absolutely part of it. They say on average everyone gains about 500 grams every year, but it can also be because if women are of older age and they might have other medical conditions that may increase their risk of gestational diabetes. For some women who are on different types of fertility treatment, some of the medications they use for that can increase the risk of gestational diabetes and things like that. I, again, as I say, these are our society is 
geared so that women are having their babies at an older age. And I, again, as I said, I don't think anyone should be blamed for any of this. And there's certainly you haven't caused this to happen just because you might be slightly older. I would say the average age of women having babies in Australia is steadily increasing and that reflects society now compared to what it was 30 years ago. And yeah, th- th- those are probably the reasons why. Mm. Interesting. And you definitely touched on a subject, so we'll open this up now, and that's around the controversy around how gestational diabetes is diagnosed. I mean, there is definitely controversy around it at the moment. There's controversy around the tests that are used and the ranges that they use. So can we talk a little bit about how it is diagnosed, why there's so much controversy around the methods and ranges used to diagnose them, and what potentially are the alternatives for people who don't want to do the gestational diabetes test? I know that's a big question and there's lots of different factors to that because I know there's controversy around the actual test itself, the ranges, and there's people that don't want to do it. They don't want to put themselves through that. So can we talk a little bit to that? Absolutely. So at the moment, for most women who are pregnant, the recommendation in Australia is sometime between 26 and 28 weeks that women have what's called a glucose tolerance test. Mm -hmm. So this means that you fast from midnight the night before, go in the morning, have a blood sugar when you've not had anything to eat or drink, and then have a, a drink that has 75 grams of glucose in it. And so that's that's equivalent to sort of a Mars bar, I guess, okay? And then you have another blood test at one hour and two hours. The guidelines we use in Australia are based on the uh, levels associated with higher rates of adverse outcomes as seen in that um, HAPO study in 2008. Um, and they thought that if and the risk of an adverse outcome happening was 1.75 greater than the baseline risk, then that's where the cutoff should be. And that's where the cutoff has has happened here. In saying that, I certainly know from my own patients, a lot of them say, listen, I would never have 75 grams of glucose in one go. I'm not a person who does that. And so for me, I feel like putting sugar that is artificial in a way that I would never, ever drink or in a in normal life seems um, unruly for me. Um, And there are alternatives that you can do. I think I strongly believe in a woman's uh, ability to choose what they do but if, certainly if they want to do want to make sure that their pregnancy is not at risk of gestational diabetes but don't want to go through this having the sugar test then women can between that sort of 24 to 28 week period choose to just monitor their blood sugar so take a fasting blood sugar every morning and a two-hour glucose two hours after each meal. And so they would have to finger prick themselves and look at the glucose level. And we normally say that a two-week period gives us a good sort of level of where women are at and allows for what a normal life would be like. And if they've had two hours where, two weeks, sorry, where their sugars are relatively normal and and would be within our sort of treatment targets, then we would say that they don't have gestational diabetes. We used to, certainly for some women, recommended that they have an early glucose test, and that's based basically on risk factors that we've talked about before. And again, that can be done by either testing for two weeks or doing the oral glucose tolerance test as well. Mm -hmm. Because there's been some controversy around the actual drink itself from Mm -hmm. my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because I know that in America, they've changed it. Is that correct? Or there's been, they've cut a specific thing out of it because it was deemed to be unsafe. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I'll admit that my knowledge on that isn't super strong, Mm -hmm. but the test we have, the drink that we have here is basically like a flat lemonade, but with a titrated concentration of 75 grams of glucose. Unfortunately, most of these drinks do have preservatives and things in them. And and that's why women may choose not to have pop that into their body. So I think the best place to go from here would actually be because 
I just brought up this conversation. We were just talking about the drink and how there were some issues with it in America and people not wanting to do the test, which is great. And I love that there's an alternative around there. But there's certainly some myths and misconceptions around gestational diabetes. Mm -hmm. What would you believe are the most common myths and misconceptions about gestational diabetes that do need to be debunked? Yes, so I think certainly one of the biggest thing is that gestational diabetes is something that someone's brought on themselves because of their lifestyle choices or their, their dietary choices or their lack of exercise, etc. And I think that is not true. Gestational diabetes can happen to anyone, okay? And I think there should that guilt should be taken over. I think the reason why um, gestational diabetes is... Um, screen for and treat them for is that we know that it can be associated with babies being a bit larger and babies being a bit larger certainly can have a lot more trauma being delivered particularly in a, as, as part of vaginal delivery and uh, babies can have their shoulder stuff which can lead to less oxygen going to the brain etc um, and so there are certainly those things and that, that's why it's treated for but these outcomes I think are quite rare and when a woman is diagnosed with gestational diabetes, but they have well-controlled diseases, most of these things do not happen, okay? To the point where we know that when women have gestational diabetes and it's well-controlled by diet alone, we would treat them as a normal pregnancy because we think the risks of a large for gestational age baby, shoulder dystocia, preeclampsia, and even stillbirth are not that different to the general population. Mm. It's mainly meant for women. And there's no, I think the other thing is there's gestational diabetes and there's gestational diabetes. So there's gestational diabetes where women change their lifestyle a little bit and their sugars are perfectly controlled and they never know. They might have a little bit of high sugar if they have pizza one night or something like that. But most of the time they're very well controlled and they haven't really had to change their lifestyle. And there are other women who, despite changing their lifestyle and being on quite high doses of insulin, they're still really finding it difficult to control their diabetes. And those are different diseases and they should be treated differently. And I think there's a lot of myths out there that everyone with gestational diabetes needs to be induced at 37 to 38 weeks, et cetera. And I think that's not true. Certainly for those women who are struggling to control their diabetes and are on high doses of insulin, that's when really the risks of having a bigger baby, having the risk of stillbirth goes up. But for women who have very well-controlled disease, we would treat them like a You've talked about so many things that I know I want to go down a little bit deeper in, but you've mentioned nutrition and I understand that you're not a dietitian and I will want to be talking about this with a dietitian at some point. But when it comes to nutrition, I genuinely think as much as people are like, oh, I've got a really good diet, like my nutrition's good, I feel like there is actually a general lack of education when it comes to nutrition. But then when you add that layer of complexity and pregnancy on top of it, it actually really shows the gaps in people's knowledge around it. And so from your perspective, and again, I understand you're not a dietitian, but what kind of dietary changes would be recommended when managing gestational diabetes? Absolutely. So again, I think, yeah, I agree completely. And my disclosure is that absolutely I'm not a dietitian, but I think there are some basic principles that, that can be used. So as we said, carbohydrates are still really important for fetal brain development and growth, et cetera. But it's about using the right type of carbohydrate and mostly the right amount of carbohydrate as well okay so we certainly know that instead of having say white bread you would choose whole grain or sourdough breads which are have a lower glycemic index so basically what that means is uh, when you have uh, processed foods like white food white rice or um, white bread your sugar spikes up really quickly and then goes down really quickly and you don't feel full for very long and, and you get uh, quite hungry so whereas whole grain foods and sourdough uh, bread are more slowly broken down so your sugar goes up more gently and comes down more gently as well so things like uh, so in terms of carbohydrates choosing the right one so choosing basmati rice instead of jasmine rice or long grain rice as a lower glycemic index 
instead of using sort of white pasta, using either whole grain or sort of lentil pasta and avoiding starchy vegetables like potato, corn, et cetera, which are high in, high in those sugars. We certainly know that things should be avoided that are processed food. So certainly sweets and lollies and ice cream and chocolate and chips and things like that. But it's using those barley, quinoa, semolina, all of those things have a much lower glycemic index. And a lot of women say they get diagnosed with gestational diabetes and they actually find a new way of eating that they continue throughout the rest of their lives. I always tell my women that they've got a plate that half of it should be veggies, a quarter should be a lean protein, and a quarter should be a complex carbohydrate. And that's what the plate should look like, which Mm. is probably the way that we ate maybe 50 years ago before processed foods became a really easy thing to be able to grab in the supermarket. But that's what we say. And we still would tell women to have fruit and, and things like that. But again, choosing fruits with the lower glycemic index of so things like berries and, and things like that over things like stone fruit, which have a much higher glycemic index. And it does really make it a little bit more complicated for women because I feel like a, a nutrition during pregnancy is such a big change anyway because there's so many things that they can and can't do and they've got to change the way that they eat generally most people do and then you've got that other layer of complexity on top of it and I know that there's so much change going on during pregnancy as it is across their whole life and then that's that extra layer of things that they need to think about and do and monitor and I know that it can be a difficult journey for some women but you have mentioned the rest of their life and how gestational diabetes can help women make changes for the rest of their life. But when it comes to how gestational diabetes can impact their life further down the track, what does that look like? Yeah. So we know that once women have had gestational diabetes, they're certainly at more increased risk of getting type 2 diabetes later on in life. Okay, so we know that about 50% of women with gestational diabetes will end up being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes within sort of 15 years. And we know that children of women who have gestational diabetes are also at risk of having impaired glucose tolerance in cells and also being obese and having the increased risk factors for cardiovascular disease as well. But the great thing about that is that women who have gestational diabetes would be told about this at their sort of postpartum visit. And again, they can often institute the lifestyle changes that they, and, and, and that will reduce their risk of getting type 2 diabetes as well. And they also know that they should be aware of it. We tell women who've had gestational diabetes to see their GPs every year so that they get a fasting glucose and uh, a test called an HbA1c, which looks at their long-term glucose control over uh, over three months. And, And that they're on the lookout for type 2 diabetes and anything that's found and treated early always has much better outcomes than um things that are left alone and not treated so in a way knowledge is power and as I said there's a lot of women who tell me that once they've done it in pregnancy and remember pregnancy is a highly motivating time because you've got a clear goal there's a clear end date and there is someone that you are doing these things for which that being your baby it's a time where women I think are often very empowered and very motivated to make changes in their lifestyle as well. And I've had women tell me that the best thing that ever happened to them was their diagnosis of gestational diabetes. And I make that phone call not infrequently to say, hey, I've got your gestational diabetes test and it does show that. And people are always devastated when I give them that call, okay, to the point where they say, oh, no, why are you calling me? This must be not good news. But then most people would say, and I definitely have women say that's the best thing that's happened to them because it really made them look back and and think about their dietary choices and things. And they said, this is the first time somebody told me how I should be eating. And I, I didn't know that this wasn't the right thing to do. I thought I was eating healthily. And it's, it can also be a very empowering thing as well. Mm, absolutely. And you are right. This goes back to my point earlier. A lot of people think that they're eating well, but then when it comes to something like this, they realize actually there's gaps in my knowledge and it can be 
a positive thing. So I love that. And you also mentioned exercise. So (laughs) being a strength coach, I know how important exercise is in the management of gestational diabetes, but it would be really good to hear that from a medical perspective, why exercise is so important when it comes to the management of gestational diabetes and also how physical activity influences your blood sugar levels during pregnancy. Absolutely. So physical activity, I think, is so important in pregnancy. Full stop, whether you have gestational diabetes or not, okay, I think it improves your someone's mental health significantly. It keeps your strength up during pregnancy. And I think people don't realise that labour and delivery is like running a marathon, okay, and you wouldn't attempt to run a marathon without training for it. And similarly, I always tell my women, you should keep your activity up because you wouldn't attempt labor without working on your strength through either a strength coach or a physiotherapist and keeping up your cardiovascular exercise as well. So we know that exercise after after meals certainly stops that spiking up of the sugars and it's so important. And some women, they could still eat pretty much what they used to. And then they go for a 30-minute walk after each meal and they never get a spike in the sugar. And again, that's something that women say that, oh, gosh, I didn't realise it was so easy just to, you know, walk for 30 minutes after each meal, which for a lot of women is very achievable, okay, but also exercises that are more based on strength and muscle as well. Again, just level out the sugars very well. There are a lot of, I think it's lots of people, again, women who do grab their significant others to do the exercise with them as well, and then or grab their dog and go for a walk around. I think everyone in the family benefits from it. There are certainly lots of partners who end up losing weight because they've gone on the gestational diabetes journey with their with their partner. So they've started eating better, they've exercised more, and there are lots of very happy dogs who are now taking on many more walks than normal. Certainly it benefits not only the woman, but, but often the entire family as well. And I think that's the other thing as well. For women who are diagnosed with gestational diabetes, it's you don't go through pregnancy, childbirth, and caring for a child alone. You have a village around you, and certainly you shouldn't go through the diagnosis alone. Grab someone else, get someone else to go through the diet with you, get someone to go through the exercises with you. And every, everything's more fun when you do something together anyway. Mm. So just in terms of that, I will steal a piece of advice from one of the guests that I've had on here yeah. around exercising after the meals. And yeah. she was saying that you can actually allocate your housework or your chores absolutely after you eat so doesn't even necessarily mean going for a walk but if you've got to do the dishes or hang the washing out or vacuum or whatever like that you can actually structure those kind of household chores around your meals so you can have something to eat and then go do your household chores and just moving your body like that can soak up your blood sugar absolutely and then you also have a lovely clean house at the end of it so do the vacuuming do the washing absolutely and those chores that are annoying to do just allocate them because it's going to make your blood sugars better i absolutely agree i have patients who tell me that instead of sitting down and watching tv after a meal they just walk around their living room because in winter it's cold and dark and they don't want to go outside and so that's what they do or they put away their toddler's toys afterwards they go around the house pick it up and put it away and that's again any sort of movement is good certainly if you can structure it that's great but if not do something. Absolutely. I think it's such an important thing to do. And now in terms of delivery, because you've mentioned delivery and I know you did mention it before saying that there are two different gestational diabetes isn't just one kind of pathway for women. There's all different pathways. And there are some women that can be eating correctly, they're exercising regularly, they're taking their medication or they're doing those things and they still have to be medicated and the medication manages to even it out. There's women that are doing all those things and taking the medication and it's still not under control. And there's women that are doing the exercise and nutrition and it's managed completely fine. Now, those women are going to have different birth paths. So Can we talk about the circumstances where a gestational diabetes diagnosis would potentially change a woman's birth path? Absolutely. So I think there are basically two, roughly, broadly speaking, two things that change a birth path. So one is a baby that is 
big because of gestational diabetes. Ability to monitor babies are through ultrasound in terms of size. And we know that if the estimated fetal weight at birth is thought to be greater than 4.5 kilograms in women with gestational diabetes, and certainly those who are treated uh, with insulin as well, that likely a caesarean section may be recommended for them. And that all comes down to the risk of shoulder dystocia. And so we know that babies of mothers who have diabetes have different ways in which they put their adipose tissue on so that they put their adipose tissue around their shoulders. And so certainly the shoulder, the bony part of the shoulder can get stuck to the bony part of the pelvis. And that's a medical emergency where we know that if the baby is not delivered in an adequate time, it can cause quite significant harm to their brain. It can cause significant harm to the nerves around their shoulders and their arms um, and can cause significant trauma to women as well. So for those women, often a cesarean section is recommended. If we think the weight's going to be that sort of target at 40, 41 weeks. Sometimes women may be offered an induction of labour a bit earlier, sort of 38 to 39 weeks. And then the second one is for, the second large class is for women on very high doses of insulin who still can't seem to control their sugars very well. That's another reason for why induction may be recommended a bit earlier as well. And usually around 38 to 39 weeks, We also know on the flip side, when women have gestational diabetes on high doses of insulin and they have very small babies as well, we know those babies are at at risk of poor perinatal outcomes and at an increased risk of stillbirth as well. And again, we would probably recommend delivery around sort of 38 to 39 weeks or sooner, depending on the growth and well-being of the baby. But for most women who have well-controlled diabetes on either diet alone or a low dose of insulin, we would not normally recommend they would be treated just like a normal pregnancy. That's good to hear because I know some women feel if they've been diagnosed with gestational diabetes, they definitely think I'm going to have a C-section or this is what's going to have to happen to my birth pass. So knowing that it's not necessarily the end of your ideal birth I would say I would call it because yeah. for the picture that you have in your head of your birth path and your birth getting a gestational diabetes diagnosis isn't necessarily the end of that dream absolutely and I yeah agree with that absolutely completely and I think the other thing is even if you may need to deviate a little bit from your ideal birth plan There's lots of things that you can do to still make it as close to your ideal birth plan as possible. I think it's really important to discuss that with your individual care provider because there's lots of things that we can still do to make it as close to your ideal birth plan as possible. And obviously I don't want to try and fear monger here or or put a negative spin on this. We've touched on quite a lot of points throughout this conversation. And when it comes to the potential short-term and long-term impacts of gestational diabetes on mothers and their babies, we've got things in the kind of short-term column. And you may want to add to this because I've been making notes as we go along, but you've got things like having a big baby, the potential birth trauma of that on both the mum and the baby. You've got potentials for preeclampsia and a potential stillbirth as well. Those are in kind of the short-term category. And feel free to add to these. And then on the longer term, you've got things like 50% of women develop type 2 diabetes within 15 years of a gestational diabetes diagnosis and then the children of women diagnosed with gestational diabetes have a higher risk of becoming diabetics and obesity later in life is that correct that is absolutely correct I guess shorter term neonatal outcomes include so babies who are born to mothers with diabetes that may not be as ideally controlled as one would hope would certainly be an increased risk of themselves having low blood sugars and so needing to have their blood sugars increase through either you know express breast milk or formula or even um, needing sort of a sugar drip there can also be an increased risk of jaundice as well later on in life as well I think the thing that is important to know is that These are things that can 
can be prevented right these are things that can be prevented by changing one's lifestyle it's not something that's futile that will definitely happen okay and i think also the risks of uh, getting type 2 diabetes after gestation diabetes are more common if you have some of those other risk factors so an increased body mass index etc things like that whereas these are things that can be prevented not yeah so it's 50 percent of women if you do absolutely nothing Okay, but if you eat well, exercise well, lose weight, etc., then it's much, much lower. The theme here is yeah. lifestyle. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think, yeah, lots of things that you can do. And eat, as I said, so similar to how even with absolutely no risk factors, you can develop gestational diabetes, even if you do everything right, some people may develop type 2 diabetes. And there's genetic and environmental factors that we don't know of that are playing a part. It's not like cystic fibrosis where we know the genes that cause it. We can test people and, and, and go from there. It's, unfortunately, diabetes is, is very multifactorial. We might get to that point at, at some stage where we can do very individualised medicine, but at the moment. So it's not a given, but if you do nothing, then yes, there is an increased risk, especially if you have a body mass index of greater than um, 30 kilograms per meter squared but there is lots and lots of things that that you can do to reduce the risk of that and I think again it's knowledge is power if you're at additional risk you go and see your GP every year make sure you haven't developed type 2 diabetes but you also check your cholesterol level your blood pressure and overall reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease as well. And now there's one other thing that I wanted to talk to you about and that's Around the continuous glucose monitoring, the continuous glucose monitor has definitely become another way for people that are in the health and well-being sphere to monitor their health ongoing. Yes. And I know in the Preggy Training Crew private WhatsApp community, I have had questions around the continuous glucose monitoring during pregnancy. And I did a significant amount of research on this and came to my own conclusion yes. uh, which I won't share right now because I'd <laughs> like to hear because <laughs> I'd like to hear yours if that's okay so what's what are your thoughts on continuous glucose monitoring during pregnancy okay so I think for women so firstly I guess it is expensive so they're not cheap and secondly they're not uh, completely validated in the space you can use them as an adjunct, leave them on, but also check to see if they are accurate. So there are lots of ways in which they can be inaccurate. We know for women who have, for example, a lower body mass index, if you lean on it too much, you'll get low sugars, for example, which is not accurate. And so you still do need to calibrate with the gold standard, which is a fingerprint. They are certainly used very routinely in women with pre-existing diabetes, which we've not really spoken about here, but certainly for women with, for example, type 1 diabetes and even, you know, their standard of care, they continue during pregnancy, but they work in a different way in which they work in a loop with an insulin pump and they feed off each other and they're a bit more accurate. For women who do not have gestational diabetes, I don't think you need to have that on, okay? I think it's going to cause more problems than not because I think there are certainly inaccuracies and for women who do have gestational diabetes they can use be used as an adjunct but you would still need to make sure they're accurate with some fingerprint testing so probably not four times a day if there's a bit of an erroneous result you would just need to check and calibrate it often um, but I think certainly I would not be encouraging women who do not have a diagnosis of gestational diabetes to be using them at all i think they can cause a lot of anxiety for no reason and a lot of a lot of problems which is finding problems that aren't there potentially mm, that's pretty much the conclusion that i came to as Excellent. well so i'm glad to know that <laughs> i'm glad to know that we're aligned on that yeah i came to the because data is great Yes. But when you're already overwhelmed with stuff, it can just add to that overwhelm that you're feeling. And I think at the end of the day, if you weren't monitoring pre-pregnancy, how do you know that the readings that you're getting Absolutely. are 
are valid if because there's so many changes that your body goes through. Obviously, they will be correct in some term, but right. in comparison to what your non-pregnancy, I think correct. if you're already using it, great, continue to yeah. use it because you right. understand the data and you're already incorporating that into your everyday life. Correct. But then adding another layer of complexity onto an already complex, challenging, transforming time, I think, yeah, it can add more. What's the word for it? I think it, it adds more <laughs> uh, like opening Pandora's box, what you're going to get. And uh, yeah, I think certainly for women with type 1 diabetes, it has revolutionized their lives and absolutely they should be using it and say maybe even with type 2 diabetes etc and again if there's an insulin pump that's used as part of that sort of protocol absolutely it's amazing it works well leads to better outcomes and i think we've got studies that show that but we've got absolutely no studies when it comes to just a glucose monitor on a healthy woman or really even for someone with gestational diabetes that's well controlled so i think certainly if you don't have a diagnosis you really shouldn't worry about it and you may be changing the way you eat or exercise based on those results, which may not be accurate as well. That's a great point as well. Now, before we sign off, is there anything that you feel like we haven't covered that's not, really important to know? I think it is one of those things. I think people think pregnancy is 40 weeks or 42 weeks and then it's finished or 42 weeks and the six weeks afterwards and it's finished. But I think for a lot of pregnancy complications, they do have longer term risk factors and need follow up. And so I think that's probably the most important thing to know. And I think the thing is, this is knowledge is power. And there's lots of things you can prevent these sort of adverse impacts from happening. That, that's probably, I think it's an empowering thing rather than something that's significantly bad. And just one last question before I go, and you can answer this in any way that you feel is beneficial to the listeners. Absolutely. And that would be, what's the one thing you wish all women knew before having a baby? I think the one thing I wish everyone knew is that Dr. Google does not replace your healthcare professional, your midwife, your trusted person that is looking after your pregnancy. I think it's great that we have so much information at our fingertips, but not all of that information is accurate. And I think certainly uh, some of that information, especially that on social media, which is perhaps promoted by people, has a twist to it or has a little hidden agenda, even if it doesn't mean to sometimes. And I think people uh, often hear the worst case scenarios or the best case scenarios, but remembering that most people fall somewhere in the middle. So I think that's great that we have information, but if there's something that's confusing you or something that you is worrying you or something that you want more information about, it's really important to reach out to the person that's looking after your pregnancy and discuss that with them directly because most of the time I think you might be worrying about absolutely nothing. I completely agree with that. <laughs> so I have termed that the Google tab phenomenon. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, so I've done videos on the Google tab phenomenon, but I just want to say thank you so much because it's people like you and obviously I'm trying my best with the pregnancy process to get the right information out there because there really is in this space, there's so much contradictory information. There's so much conflicting misinformation. Then on top of that, you've got social media influencers, you've got your family and friends telling you one thing. So I think it's really important for women to find a trusted source and lean on them. And I think researching that source is really important, like getting to know and understand who this person is that you're actually listening to or turning to for advice and what qualifications have they really got in this. I think that's so important. So thank you so much for reiterating that. I completely agree. And thank you so much for your time today. I genuinely appreciate it. Thank you. Oh. It was lovely. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation. And if you're hearing this message, I want to say a huge thank you because it means that you've listened to this entire episode. 
Of course, if you have any questions about the things that we covered in this episode, or want to know more about me or my other projects, you can find me on YouTube and Instagram at The Pregnancy Process. For those currently in their conception or pregnancy journey, you can apply to join my complimentary but private community, The Preggy Training Crew. And you'll find my community application and social media links in the episode description. And of course, if you enjoyed this episode, I absolutely encourage you to share it with other women just like you. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.